and other journalists in Ohio and Kentucky in this public media collaborative called Ohio Valley Resource. A lot of the issues that we face daily here in West Virginia are the same that are in neighboring states. So these reporters and I, we get together and we coordinate in-depth stories that look at those problems and also a lot of the solutions, and then they're broadcast throughout the region. This is our mission, to provide substantial, meaningful journalism for those communities. Your sustaining gift helps protect West Virginia public broadcasting. Donate at wvpublic.org. You're never at a loss for TV that tells you stories with West Virginia Public Broadcasting. This special brand of television relies on your financial support. Become a sustaining member today. You're watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Learn more at aarp.org wv. The Charleston Gazette Mail, using its CGM app to deliver the latest news, traffic, and weather alerts, keeping you in the know while you're on the go. Lumos Networks, online at lumosnetworks.com. Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Orion Strategies, professional public relations, government affairs, creative services, and research and polling with offices in Charleston, Buchanan, Martinsburg, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Good evening and welcome to the Legislature Today. I'm Suzanne Higgins along with Dave Mistich here at the Capitol. It's been a marathon day in the West Virginia Senate. Uh, Dave, of course, this is the Senate's uh, committee of the whole meeting on that education, comprehensive education bill. Give us some background. Where, how did we wind up here and, and what's happening today? Um, just to go all the way back as we've done, just to catch everyone back up. Um, this committee of the whole is in lieu of the Senate Finance Committee. That's where the bill was second referenced to begin with. Some questions over the bill's viability in that committee. And then they've essentially doubled the size of that committee. And now we're at the committee of the whole, which is the entire chamber. All 34 members of the body are listening to um, presentations on the bill. We're expecting testimony later this evening. It's far from over at this point. And, and so we're addressing the provisions of the bill right now. Um, which is, again, a, a committee substitute. There have been some changes to the bill. Uh, bring us out, out, outline those for us. Well, so we heard yesterday that they were gonna remove this teacher-pupil ratio change, the maximum size it was at 25. Uh, it's supposed to go up to 28 with an allowance up to 31. That's been uh, struck out of the bill. They also made a few clarifications. One was that all extracurricular activities are not permitted during a work, work stoppage due to a strike. Um, it also clarified that the State Board of Education has rulemaking authority regarding public charter schools. They've capped the education savings accounts at tw uh, 2,500 accounts. They've modified the teacher bonus to allow $500 for every 10 days of sick leave. And they had, I think, initially offered for those 10 days to be converted into a month of health care coverage upon retirement. Um, and that, again, that $500 bonus is for every 10 days of sick leave at, at the point of retirement. So. Um, and it also added some internal effective dates for each provision of the bill. I'll go ahead and hold this up. I think it's 71 <laughs> pages mm -hmm. worth of uh, worth of PowerPoint slideshows that they that council went through. Um, you know, members of the committee are asking questions, sort of delving into each provision of the bill over the course of the day. 
Um, it's been up and down. We've heard about various aspects of the bill. Um, the Democrats, of course, challenging many of these provisions. Republicans mostly standing in support. We should go back in and, and make one other note here. Um, when, this, when this committee gaveled in, there was a motion to resolve into this committee. Uh, Senator Bill Hamilton, a Republican, was the only Republican to break with his majority party on that vote to resolve into this committee. Uh, we've heard all along that he's questionable, likely a no vote on the bill the way it stands now. So as things roll along, getting a better picture of what this bill looks like, and it's all happening in front of the entire Senate right now. All right, and we've uh, gone over that list of, of hot button topics over the last couple of days, charter schools, the non-severability clause, uh, the paycheck protection clause. Uh, go, go through what we've been hearing this afternoon. And, and session started at 9.30, but this uh, meeting started at 11. That's so right. it's been going on for hours. You know, and one of the big hot topics, and we've known this all along as charter schools, it's one of the big, folk, big parts of this bill. Um, granted, we should point out that the, the unions, the educators, the Board of Education has its problems with some of the components of this bill. Um, we're going to take a look right now of some back and well, some, some conversation on the floor from Senators uh, John Unger and Tom Takubo about various aspects of the charter schools being established in this bill. So my question is, is the teachers that go into the uh, charter schools, are they required to have a college degree? Um, no, there's nothing in this uh, that requires that they have a, uh, a bachelor's degree. How about a high school degree? Uh, no, the bill doesn't address, address that. How about any school at all? I mean, if they were ever in school, whatever, are they required to have any educational requirements? The bill doesn't require that, but now the governing board uh, may have certain requirements that they have to meet. So, so the governing board may may have that, right. but it's right now it's not required. Okay. But there's nothing in the bill that would prohibit if you had a uh, charter, a public charter school that did have, uh, let's say for example, it was a a STEM charter. They had very advanced mathematics, and and the teachers and the surrounding public school systems knew they had. Um, maybe you'd say above average and, and wanted them to participate in the charter advanced mathematics, there's nothing that would prohibit that if arrangements were made between that public charter and the surrounding charters. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. In terms of, of education, is there anything in the bill that would prohibit the charter from having only PhDs teach or instruct at that school? No, there's nothing that would prohibit that. And again, this is such a big bill. Um, we got a copy of it here today. The committee substitute as it stands is at 133 pages. I mean, they're, they're going down the line listening to or having conversations about, uh, I wouldn't say every provision in this bill because there are a lot, but the main ones that they're focusing on over the course of this meeting. Um, Senator Corey Palumbo, um, you know, a Democrat from Kanawha County here, he had some questions for council over this non-severability clause. We've heard a lot about this. Basically, um, the, the way to describe this clause is that if this bill were to go to a court challenge, uh, if any provision of the bill would be uh, held invalid by the court, the entire bill would be, would be dissolved, would be invalid itself. So here's a little bit of an exchange between uh, Senator Palumbo and, some count and, and members of council over this particular clause in the bill. Council, I've, I've not seen this kind of provision in, in bills before. I've seen the opposite, where if some, something was struck down, the rest of the bill stays in, intact. And I'm sure there's some precedent for this. Are you familiar with how often this kind of provision has been used? I'm, I'm really not um, familiar with how often it's been used. I don't know. I, I've never seen it either, but I will tell you that West Virginia Code 2-2-10, subsection CC provides that in standard construction of our statutory language in West Virginia, we have a blanket severability clause, unless the legislature decides otherwise. So there is some authority in our code for such a provision as this. And I'm not questioning that, I'm just questioning if it's ever been done before, or if you're aware of it. I've never written one. Okay, just, I mean, what's, 
what's the educational purpose of this clause? Is there any value to it that's going to advance education? I mean, I'm just kind of perplexed by it. I mean, to me, honestly, it's just, it's kind of mean-spirited. It's, uh, you know, it's, the, I think it's, it's trying to discourage anyone who doesn't like the bill from, from challenging it in the thought that it's going to, anything that people like about it, like pay raises, they'll, they'll lose those. I mean, can you dissuade me of that kind of thinking by telling me what the value of this kind of provision is, if any? Well, um, about the only thing I can say is that normally I would think the justification for something like this would be that the things are so interrelated. Um, in other words, in this case, public education reform. Um, so I don't. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the only thing that um, no, only explanation I can really give is that I would think that a, a provision like this would be included in a bill where things are interrelated, uh, and in this case, I guess it would be comprehensive education reform. So, so by that way of thinking, the thought is, if, for example, education savings accounts were struck down as unconstitutional or something, then there'd be no value in charter schools, or there'd be no value in the pay raises. That's the school of thought. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. We want to add here that uh, the governor was up uh, outside of the Senate uh, early this morning, and he was commenting on all of these, the charter school, the non-severability, um, he said that he felt it was tactical and it was a tactical error, um, that it was just in, inciting a very divisive atmosphere. And, and um, he, he said that in terms of the charter schools, he went so far as to say that he could consider a pilot program, maybe a couple of charter schools, but to, to pass this comprehensive bill legalizing it, implementing it statewide, it was just too, too much. Um, Dave, also the West Virginia Board of Education had an emergency meeting today. That's right, and they heard from speakers. Uh, they actually, uh, later on in, in, in their meeting today, they, made, they went through the provisions of the bill one by one and basically uh, expressed support or opposition to each of the provisions. I'm not gonna go through that list, um, but you know, just looking at Twitter, uh, you know, the, the Department of Education's Twitter account um, they're, they're against the non-severability clause, against payroll protection, um, against charter schools, um, th against the equity pay provision. Um, they do endorse the supplement for math teachers. Um, you know, they went one by one in all this. A couple things I want to point out really, really quickly. They, they're, they're recommending that the legislature take each of these provisions in Senate Bill 451 and be considered as separate bills. Um, one of the things that, that you know, Democrats uh, the unions and the governor himself has, has offered as a suggestion to this bill. Um, they also are sending these recommendations to Senate President Mitch Carmichael and you know pr uh, the board president, David Perry, he moved and they passed a motion uh, to create a commission that includes all teacher organizations, PTA, State Board of Education, school board associations, service personnel associations, and legislative leadership to discuss how to create a world-class education environment in West Virginia. So that was one of the final actions from that meeting today. And because we've heard over and over again, they haven't had the input into this huge, huge bill. That's right, so and I just want to echo, echo that, you know, the, the, the board's recommendations seem to reflect that of professional educators, of the unions, of what we're hearing from teachers around the state. So where do we go from here? That's right, well, this meeting uh, is still ongoing here in the Senate. Uh, as you mentioned, it started at 11 this morning. Um, could go late into the evening. We don't know if they're going to take a break tonight and pick it back up tomorrow. Uh, one would imagine that they're going to kind of go all the way through with this. We're expecting testimony. The Democrats have provided the committee clerk a list. Uh, I've also been getting emails from the National Alliance for, Pub for Charter Schools saying that they're going to be testifying this evening. Uh, we haven't seen a full list of people that, that are expected to testify, but we are only in the questions of counsel phase of this meeting. Uh, got a long way to go. Uh, there's, you know, amendments later on, action on the bill could take a really long time. Whether that's tonight, whether it's tomorrow, uh, that remains to be seen. All right. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank we you. We appreciate it. And we'll be back in just a moment. We're small for a news organization that covers an entire state, but very dedicated, hardworking professionals 
who are very invested in the communities in which they live. We have reporters all over the state, including one in Wheeling, one in Shepherdstown, one in Athens, West Virginia, one in Mingo County, West Virginia, two in Charleston, and two in Morgantown, where I'm based. And our beats range quite widely from health to energy and environment to arts and culture and politics. During the legislative session, we go live from the Capitol every weekday. We deliver our news in a variety of different ways, primarily through our show, West Virginia Morning, which airs at 7.41 during Morning Edition, and also during the afternoon newscasts during All Things Considered. We also have a distinct web presence at wvpublic.org, where people can find all of our work on demand. Your sustaining gift helps protect West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Majority Leader first. A sweeping foster care bill is ready for a vote in the House tomorrow. Joining us now are House Majority Leader Amy Summers and Assistant House Majority Leader Kayla Kessinger. Thank you both for joining me tonight. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, Delegate Kessinger, let, let's begin with you. Um, the, the bill moves foster care children into a managed care system for not only health care needs, but emotional needs and social needs. And this is what we've heard, the biggest uh, bone of contention. Um, and we heard that in a public hearing um, uh, among foster parents, among children advocates. Um, I'd, I'd like to start the discussion. There was an amendment on the floor this morning by Delegate John Doyle that would actually have nixed that huge component of the bill. Let's go ahead and listen. This is Delegate Flash Hour. Flash Hour. Um, and we'll come back and talk about that. What we need is more money injected into our current system so that those families can stay together. We do not need an out-of-state company that's making phone calls and checking up on these families to come in and tell us to skim profit off the top and tell us how we should handle the children in our state. I think that we all want it. I don't think this is the kind of situation where we say this isn't working, let's do something different. There's a lot of experience with managed care and in some places it's been a disaster. It needs, if we're gonna do this, which I'm not convinced we should, it should be done slowly like in New York. And it should, there should be a lot of stops along the way to make sure it's, it's working right. Delegate Kessinger, um, that for-profit incentive of a managed care uh, system is what we've heard from opponents over and over. Um, that amendment failed, but defend that position. That sure. So um, there's a lot of misconceptions about managed care organizations. There's a lot of, I think, um, fear surrounding what a managed care organization does. Um, right now in West Virginia, there are 400,000 West Virginians who are receiving health care through a managed care organization. Of those 400,000, 150,000 of them are West Virginia children. We have been utilizing managed care organizations since 1996. All we are doing by providing a managed care organization to take in, to the, to take in the 7,000 kids um, uh, in foster care and the children that are in kinship care under this umbrella, creating a network that will intend to promote a continuity of care for each of these children. Right now, DHHR has testified on numerous occasions that um, because the system is convoluted, there are medical records that are being lost. There are instances where children are receiving duplicative vaccinations. Um, and what we believe um, as House leadership is that that is not okay. The status quo is not okay. Um, this concern about these for-profit companies profiting off of um, the, man the managed care organizations profiting, I think they're limited to a 1% profit margin. Um, so we are doing this for the sole purpose of ensuring that these kids are not falling through the cracks as they have been for the last several decades. There's a concern that uh, about the in-state mandate for care that um, currently specialized care, and these, these children have been through the most horrific of traumas, um, sometimes you need to go a a across the border. Um, uh, what is your response to that, that this is, um, this is curtailing the best 
uh, the, the best uh, services possible for that child. Sure, well I think we're actually talking about two separate portions of the yes, bill. Definitely. The managed care organization specifically deals with creating a network of providers for the children within the foster care system. Um, I think what you're referring to um, is a clause within the bill um, that um, Delegate Summers really mounted the fight for today. Right now we have almost we have more than 500 children who state. have been shipped out of state, who have been rejected by the centers in the state, who have contractually obligated themselves with DHHR to perform the necessary services. And so within that clause of the bill, that portion of the bill, we want to make sure that we as West Virginians are taking taking care of, our, of West Virginians. But as you'll hear in the, this next clip that we'll go to in, in just a moment, um, you know, the, the, the argument there is that some of these foster care uh, facilities are not equipped. They don't have the expertise, the services to take care of, say, one child with a particular need. Um, Delegate Summers, you uh, offered the amendment um, the, the component was taken out in Senate Judiciary. You, you offered the amendment that put that back in, that local facilities will accept, they will fill their beds. What was your, um, what was your point with that? Why would you put that back in when the Senate Judiciary, or excuse House me, Judiciary. House Judiciary took it out? Yes, my point with that is if you are going to sign a contract with the state of West Virginia to say you will provide a certain level of care for our children, then we expect you to honor that contract. If you do not want to be in contract with the state of West Virginia, you don't have to. Then you do not have to take the children that you don't want to care for. Well, let, let's, uh, let's listen to some of the opposition to that amendment and we'll come back and talk. It concerns me greatly that a very good facility that may, may, have, uh, may be specialized in some way not be uh, able to, to reject a child that does not fit the mix. And as I understand it, these are we're not talking about huge facilities. We're talking about some very small places with limited beds. We want to encourage these, these kinds of small facilities so that, that we can take care of of uh, foster children appropriately. Uh, maybe we could be talking with these providers back in our districts to identify what they need to be able to provide a capable environment to serve the youth that are currently placed out of state uh, at a much higher daily rate than we're paying here. Uh, some of the suggestions I got from the one back home, uh, or maybe we could invest in workforce recruitment and development to assist programs in providing these services. Maybe we could fund quality assurance measures, staff training and development, increase the supervision ratios, clinical development, and other techniques. Maybe we could consider a carve-out for funding uh, for the youth that are placed in residential treatment that accounts for a blended cost that's uh, cost-based funding that takes into account the room, the board, and the supervision. And that would go beyond what we're doing now. I think those things would actually really help us move forward with bringing the kids home without incurring additional dangers that our providers back home are telling us will happen if we put this back into the bill. Some of these facilities are just not equipped with the current children that they have to take every child. The reason the Judiciary Committee acted uh, to remove that language from the bill, and I believe it, that we were right in doing that on the Judiciary Committee, uh, is because in hearing testimony from a director of one of these programs, he gave the scenario, uh, if, if a child has a history of, of sexual abuse and say already in this facility you have other vulnerable children, say you have uh, uh, young female children in this, in this facility, it would not give them to the right to treat this child on an individual basis say, I'm sorry, we can't take this child right now. We're forcing a facility who's trying to take care of kids to take children above what they think they can handle. And it, while it, it's great to say we don't want to send kids to Georgia, do we want to keep kids here if we can't take care of them? Do we want to keep children within the walls of West Virginia's borders? Do we want to keep them on the, our side of the wall just because we want to keep them here, even if we can't take care of the kid? Delegate Summers, your, your response to that. I think that their arguments are misinformed. We want to be able to 
these agencies are saying they can provide the service. If they are now telling us that they cannot, they might need to change their business structure. They're putting it out there that they can handle the children. So if they need to decrease the level of care that they do, they can do that. What I'm hearing is we don't have enough staff or the mix might, might not be right. Some of these companies are making millions of dollars. I think they need to reinvest some of their money maybe into additional staffing or ways that they can come up with helping these children. Shipping them out of state where we don't have any eyes on them, we send that child down there and he gets checked on once a month by a CPS worker that has to fly down to Florida and check on them is not good care either. Delegate Kessinger, um, we've heard from uh, different uh, groups in the, in the public hearing and, and since the public hearing that the bill doesn't go far enough to keep families together, that, um, it, that we're too quick um, to remove a child when, you know, if there were services beforehand, we could have saved that family. Sure. Well, you know, we are currently in West Virginia, we are in a state of emergency when it comes to our foster care system. I think we all agree that our system has grown so quickly and our system is crippling under the weight of increased children who need our care. And I would agree, this bill is not the end all be all. This isn't a perfect fix. Mm -hmm. uh, Delegate Summers and I have been continuing our conversations about how are we gonna move forward next year. We want Foster Care 2.0 to be on the agenda, to be one of the first bills we crank out. And I'd also like to point out that while the managed care organization aspect and the no reject, no eject policy has gotten a lot of attention. There's a lot of things in this bill that are really important that really need to be taken care of in West Virginia that haven't got a lot of, uh, of, of attention. What are um, those? For instance, um, right now there are a lot of impediments for foster kids where they don't get to they don't get to experience a normal childhood. Right now, foster children aren't permitted to go on family vacations that cross state lines. Often they can't go to sleepovers. Often they don't have they can't go to school dances. They don't get a lot of these same experiences. They don't have equal access to a lot of these same experiences that the biological children of, of parents do. And we want to make sure that their childhood experience is just as is, is as quality as any biological child of any parent. All right, we'll have to leave it with that. Delegate Kayla Kessinger, House Assistant Majority Leader, and House Majority Leader Amy Summers. Thank you both for joining us today. The uh, foster care bill is up for passage tomorrow in the House. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this concludes our broadcast this evening. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great evening. Think Wednesday on PBS for stories from the world around us. Stories of survival. What they need is love. Forensic discoveries. It's the most remarkable project that I'll probably ever work on. And seizing power. Noriega played a very high stakes game. For stories that get you closer to life. Think Wednesday starting at 8, 7 central. Think PBS. Wake up. Wake up to the world. To the marvels. The mayhem. The music. Wake up to the wows. The woes. The wonder. Wake up to the commotion. To the beauty. To the humanity. To the hope. Wake up every morning, fully awake. Listen weekday mornings from 6 to 9 on West Virginia Public Broadcasting. West Virginia Public Broadcasting, telling West Virginia's story.
Hi, this is Anna Sale. I host the interview podcast, Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC Studios. But I got my start in radio at West Virginia Public Broadcasting. It's where I learned how to be a reporter and about how important it is to help people